Hello and welcome to Woo English, where we help you learn English through engaging stories. Today, we're diving into the fascinating life of Julius Caesar. Remember, our goal is to use clear and simple sentences to help you improve your English. Please leave your comments and don't forget to press the like button if you enjoy the story. Your support means a lot to us. Keep in mind, this story is for educational purposes only. We do not encourage or glorify the actions of the characters. Now let's begin. Hello and welcome to Woo English, where we help you learn English through engaging stories. Today, we're diving into the fascinating life of Julius Caesar. Remember, our goal is to use clear and simple sentences to help you improve your English. Please leave your comments and don't forget to press the like button if you enjoy the story. Your support means a lot to us. Keep in mind, this story is for educational purposes only. We do not encourage or glorify the actions of the characters. Now, let's begin. Chapter 1 Early Life Julius Caesar, one of the most famous figures in history, was born on July 12th, 100 BC. His full name was Gaius Julius Caesar. He was born into a patrician family, which was one of the oldest and most respected in Rome. His family claimed to be descended from the goddess Venus, and this noble lineage gave them a prominent status in Roman society. Caesar's father, also named Gaius Julius Caesar, was a senator and a governor. His mother, Aurelia Cotta, came from a noble family with strong political connections. From a young age, Caesar was surrounded by the influence of his powerful family, which shaped his future ambitions and aspirations. As a child, Caesar lived in the Subura, a lower-class neighborhood of Rome. This area was bustling with activity, filled with markets, workshops, and crowded streets. Despite the modest surroundings, his family ensured he received a good education. Caesar's upbringing in such a vibrant and diverse environment exposed him to the many facets of Roman life and society. Caesar's education was typical for a young Roman noble. He was taught by private tutors who provided instruction in various subjects. He learned to read and write in Latin and Greek, which were the languages of education and diplomacy. His studies included grammar, rhetoric, philosophy and literature. These subjects were essential for a future leader and politician, as they developed his skills in public speaking, writing, and critical thinking. One of Caesar's tutors was a man named Nifo, who was renowned for his knowledge and teaching methods. Under Nifo's guidance, Caesar became an excellent orator and writer. His speeches and writings would later become famous for their clarity, persuasiveness, and elegance. Apart from his academic education, Caesar also received physical training. He learned to ride horses, swim, and use weapons. These skills were important for a Roman nobleman as they prepared him for a future in the military. Caesar's physical education helped him develop strength, endurance, and agility, qualities that would serve him well in his later military campaigns. Caesar's childhood was not without its challenges. His father died suddenly when Caesar was only 16 years old. This left young Caesar as the head of his family. Despite the loss, Caesar showed remarkable maturity and resilience. He took on the responsibility of caring for his mother and sister, Julia. In addition to his family responsibilities, Caesar faced political challenges. During this time, Rome was a republic, but it was plagued by social and political conflicts. The Senate, which was the main governing body, was often divided, and there were frequent power struggles between different factions. Caesar grew up in a turbulent environment, witnessing the complexities and dangers of Roman politics. One of the most significant events during Caesar's youth was the civil war between the followers of Marius and Sulla. These two powerful generals represented opposing political factions. 
Marius supported the populares, who sought to represent the common people, while Sulla championed the optimates, who favoured the aristocracy. Caesar's uncle, Gaius Marius, was a leading figure of the populares. This connection put young Caesar in a precarious position when Sulla emerged victorious in the civil war and became dictator of Rome. Sulla began a campaign of proscriptions, targeting and executing his political enemies. Caesar, despite his youth, was marked for death because of his familial ties to Marius. To escape Sulla's wrath, Caesar was forced to go into hiding. He left Rome and sought refuge with various relatives and friends. Despite the danger, Caesar refused to abandon his principles. Sulla demanded that Caesar divorce his wife, Cornelia, who was the daughter of Cinna, another prominent member of the Populares. Caesar refused, displaying his unwavering loyalty and courage. Eventually, through the intercession of powerful friends and family members, Caesar was pardoned by Sulla. He returned to Rome, but the experience left a lasting impression on him. He had witnessed firsthand the brutality and unpredictability of Roman politics. This period of exile and danger helped shape his determination and resilience, qualities that would define his future career. Roman society during Caesar's youth was complex and hierarchical. At the top were the patricians, the noble families who held most of the political power. Below them were the plebeians, the common people who made up the majority of the population. The divide between these two classes often led to social tensions and conflicts. The political system of Rome was a republic, with power divided among various elected officials and institutions. The Senate, composed mainly of patricians, was the most powerful body. However, there were also other offices, such as the consuls, who were elected annually to lead the government and the army. The tribunes, elected by the plebeians, had the power to veto decisions made by other officials, providing a check on the patricians' power. Despite the republican system, Roman politics were often marked by corruption, bribery and violence. Ambitious individuals and factions frequently vied for power, leading to political instability. This environment required a keen understanding of strategy, alliances and persuasion, skills that Caesar would master throughout his career. In addition to political challenges, Rome also faced social and economic issues. The rapid expansion of the Roman Empire brought wealth and slaves into the city, but it also led to significant inequalities. The wealthy elite lived in luxury, while many plebeians struggled with poverty and unemployment. These disparities contributed to social unrest and calls for reform. Caesar's early life was deeply influenced by this dynamic and challenging environment. His education, family connections, and personal experiences prepared him for the complex world of Roman politics and military affairs. From a young age, Caesar displayed the qualities of a leader, intelligence, determination, and a keen understanding of the human nature. Chapter 2 Early Career Julius Caesar's early career set the foundation for his rise to power. His journey began in the military, where he first made a name for himself. This chapter explores his first steps in the military, his early political roles, and his personal life, including his first marriage. Military Beginnings Caesar's military career began when he was in his early twenties. In 81 BC, he joined the army, seeking both adventure and an opportunity to prove himself. His first assignment was in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. This region was a part of the Roman Empire, and Caesar served under the command of Marcus Minucius Thermus, a respected general. During one of his first campaigns, Caesar played a crucial role in the siege of Mytilene, 
a city on the island of Lesbos. The city had rebelled against Roman rule, and Thermus needed to capture it. Caesar demonstrated bravery and strategic thinking during this siege. His efforts were noticed, and he was awarded the civic crown, a prestigious military honour given for saving the life of a fellow citizen in battle. After Mytilene, Caesar was sent to Bithynia, a kingdom in northern Asia Minor. Here he served under King Nicomedes IV, who was an ally of Rome. Caesar was tasked with securing a fleet of ships for the Roman navy. He successfully completed his mission, earning praise for his diplomatic skills. Some rumours suggested that he had a close relationship with King Nicomedes, but these claims were never proven. Caesar's early military service was marked by courage, intelligence, and a talent for leadership. These qualities helped him gain respect among his peers and superiors, setting the stage for his future achievements. First Political Roles After returning to Rome, Caesar decided to enter politics. His first major political role came in 69 BC when he was elected as a quaestor, an important position responsible for financial and administrative duties. His assignment was in Hispania Ulterior, a Roman province in modern-day Spain. As quaestor, Caesar managed the province's finances and ensured that taxes were collected. He also served as an assistant to the governor. During his time in Hispania, Caesar showed a keen interest in military matters, leading small campaigns against local tribes. His success in these skirmishes boosted his reputation as a capable military leader. In 65 BC, Caesar was elected as an aedile, an official responsible for public buildings, games and festivals. This role allowed him to gain popularity with the people of Rome. He organized grand and elaborate public games, using his own money to fund them. These games were spectacular, featuring gladiator fights, theatrical performances, and wild animal hunts. The public loved these events, and Caesar became very popular. Caesar's next political step was to become the Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the College of Pontiffs. This position was one of the most prestigious religious roles in Rome. In 63 BC, Caesar campaigned vigorously for the office, and despite being the youngest candidate, he won the election. This victory not only boosted his political career, but also enhanced his social status. Two years later, in 61 BC, Caesar was appointed as the governor of Hispania Ulterior. During his governorship, he led successful military campaigns against rebellious tribes, these victories brought him wealth and further increased his fame. It was also during this time that Caesar demonstrated his ambition by seeking out new opportunities for conquest and expansion. Marriage and Personal Life While Caesar was building his military and political career, his personal life was also evolving. His first marriage was to Cornelia, the daughter of Lucius Cornelius Cinna, a powerful politician who was an ally of Marius, Caesar's uncle. Cornelia and Caesar had one child, a daughter named Julia. Cornelia's family connections brought Caesar closer to the Populares, a political faction that supported the common people. However, this alliance also put him at odds with the Optimates, who represented the aristocracy. This political tension came to a head when the dictator Sulla demanded that Caesar divorce Cornelia. Caesar refused, showing his loyalty and determination. Sulla eventually relented, but Caesar's refusal to obey a dictator marked him as a brave and principled man. Tragically, Cornelia died in 69 BC. Her death deeply affected Caesar, but he continued to focus on his career. Shortly after Cornelia's death, Caesar married Pompeia, the granddaughter of Sulla. This marriage was politically motivated, aimed at strengthening Caesar's connections with the aristocracy. However, 
the marriage was not a happy one. In 62 BC, Pompeia was involved in a scandal during the festival of Bonadea, which was meant to be a women-only event. A man disguised as a woman was found in their house, leading to rumours and accusations. Although there was no concrete evidence against Pompeia, Caesar divorced her, stating that his wife must be above suspicion. After his second divorce, Caesar focused on his political ambitions. His daughter, Julia, remained a central figure in his personal life. He adored her and ensured she received a good education. Julia later married Pompey the Great, one of Caesar's key political allies, further strengthening his political network. Caesar's early career was a mix of military exploits, political maneuvering, and personal challenges. His ability to navigate the complex world of Roman politics while maintaining his principles and ambitions set him apart as a leader. His early experiences laid the groundwork for his future successes and the remarkable legacy he would leave behind. Chapter 3. The Rise to Power Julius Caesar's rise to power was marked by his ability to form strategic political alliances, achieve notable military successes, and eventually join forces with two other powerful leaders to create the First Triumvirate. This chapter delves into these crucial steps in Caesar's journey. Caesar knew that to rise in Roman politics, he needed powerful allies. One of his earliest and most important alliances was with Marcus Licinius Crassus. Crassus was the wealthiest man in Rome, known for his enormous fortune and influential network. By aligning himself with Crassus, Caesar gained access to significant financial resources and support. Crassus, in turn, saw potential in the ambitious young Caesar and believed that their partnership could be mutually beneficial. Another key figure in Caesar's rise was Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, known as Pompey the Great. Pompey was a celebrated general who had earned great fame for his military conquests in the East. Initially, Pompey and Caesar were not close allies, but Caesar recognized the advantage of joining forces with such a powerful and respected leader. By the mid 60 BC, Caesar began to cultivate a relationship with Pompey, realizing that an alliance could strengthen his political position. Caesar's military campaigns also played a significant role in his ascent. His governorship of Hispania Ulterior provided the perfect opportunity to showcase his military prowess. In 61 BC, he led successful campaigns against rebellious tribes, which not only brought him wealth, but also further enhanced his reputation as a capable and daring leader. His soldiers admired him for his bravery and tactical skills, and their loyalty would prove crucial in his future endeavours. Returning to Rome in 60 BC, Caesar faced significant debts. Despite his successes, his lavish spending on public games and other political activities had drained his finances. However, he had a plan. He sought the consulship, the highest elected office in Rome, and knew that achieving this position would require both political and financial backing. Caesar approached Crassus for financial support, securing his backing once again. To further solidify his path to power, Caesar proposed an unprecedented political alliance with Crassus and Pompey. This alliance, known as the First Triumvirate, was formed in 60 BC. The Triumvirate was a powerful coalition that allowed the three men to dominate Roman politics. Each member had their own strengths. Crassus brought wealth, Pompey brought military prestige, and Caesar brought political cunning. Together, they could outmaneuver their opponents and push through their agendas. One of the Triumvirate's first actions was to ensure Caesar's election as consul in 59 BC. As consul, Caesar pushed for the passage of various laws that benefited both his allies and the Roman people. He redistributed land to veterans and the poor, securing popular support. 
Despite opposition from the Senate, Caesar's persistence and the backing of Crassus and Pompey enabled him to implement his reforms. After his consulship, Caesar was appointed governor of Gaul, a region that included modern-day France, Belgium, and parts of Switzerland and Italy. This position provided him with the opportunity to embark on a series of military campaigns that would cement his status as one of Rome's greatest generals. Over the next decade, from 58 BC to 50 BC, Caesar led his legions in the Gallic Wars, conquering vast territories and subduing numerous tribes. Caesar's military campaigns in Gaul were marked by brilliant strategies and audacious manoeuvres. He displayed remarkable leadership, often leading his troops from the front and sharing in their hardships. His victory at the Battle of Alesia in 52 BC was particularly significant. Caesar's forces besieged the Gallic stronghold of Alesia, where the tribal leader Vercingetorix had taken refuge. Despite being outnumbered, Caesar's ingenious use of fortifications and relentless assault led to a decisive victory, effectively ending major resistance in Gaul. These successes in Gaul brought Caesar immense wealth and fame. His soldiers, loyal and battle-hardened, were devoted to him, and the Roman public celebrated his victories. However, his growing power and influence also sparked jealousy and fear among the Roman elite. Many senators, including Pompey, began to view Caesar as a threat to the Republic's stability. Tensions between Caesar and the Senate escalated when the Senate, under the influence of Pompey, ordered Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome as a private citizen. Fearing prosecution and political oblivion, Caesar made a fateful decision. On January 10, 49 BC, he crossed the Rubicon River with his army, an act of insurrection against the Senate's authority. This bold move marked the beginning of a civil war. The ensuing conflict saw Caesar pitted against Pompey and the Senate's forces. Caesar's military genius shone once again in a series of battles across Italy, Greece and Egypt. His rapid and decisive actions left his enemies reeling. In 48 BC he achieved a significant victory at the Battle of Pharsalus in Greece, where his smaller army defeated Pompey's larger forces. Pompey fled to Egypt, where he was eventually assassinated. With Pompey's death and the defeat of his enemies, Caesar emerged as the undisputed leader of Rome. He returned to the city as a hero, but also as a dictator. Over the next few years, he enacted numerous reforms to stabilize and strengthen Rome. He extended Roman citizenship to many people in the provinces, reformed the calendar, and initiated various public works projects. Despite his achievements, Caesar's concentration of power and disregard for traditional republican norms alienated many senators. In 44 BC, a group of senators, including some whom Caesar considered friends, conspired against him. On the Ides of March, March 15, 44 BC, Caesar was assassinated in the Senate chamber. His death marked the end of the Roman Republic and paved the way for the rise of the Roman Empire. Caesar's rise to power was a complex and multifaceted journey, driven by his strategic alliances, military brilliance, and political acumen. His legacy as one of history's greatest leaders endures, and his life continues to fascinate and inspire. Chapter 4. Conquest of Gaul Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul was one of his most remarkable achievements. It was a series of military campaigns that lasted from 58 BC to 50 BC, during which Caesar expanded Rome's territory and solidified his reputation as a brilliant military leader. This chapter explores these campaigns, his tactics and strategies, and the impact of his conquest on Rome. Caesar's campaign in Gaul began in 58 BC when the Helvetii, a Gallic tribe, decided to migrate to a new territory. 
their movement threatened the stability of the region. Caesar, as the governor of Gaul, saw an opportunity to act. He swiftly mobilized his legions to intercept the Helvetii. In a decisive battle near Bibracte, Caesar's forces crushed the Helvetii, forcing them to return to their homeland. Following this victory, Caesar turned his attention to the Germanic tribes that had crossed the Rhine River into Gaul. The Germanic leader, Ariovistus, posed a significant threat. Caesar engaged Ariovistus in battle and, after a fierce fight, emerged victorious. This victory secured the region and demonstrated Caesar's ability to protect Roman interests. In 57 BC, Caesar faced another challenge from the Belgae, a confederation of Gallic tribes in northern Gaul. The Belgae had united to resist Roman expansion. Caesar marched his legions north and, through a series of battles, defeated the Belgae. His strategy involved dividing his forces to attack multiple tribes simultaneously, preventing them from uniting against him. This tactic proved effective, and the Belgae were subdued. The following year, in 56 BC, Caesar turned his attention to the Veneti, a maritime tribe in western Gaul. The Veneti had captured some of Caesar's officers, prompting a swift response. Caesar built a fleet and launched a naval campaign against the Veneti. Despite their strong defences and naval prowess, the Veneti were defeated. Caesar's ability to adapt to different types of warfare was evident in this campaign. In 55 BC, Caesar conducted a bold and unprecedented move by crossing the Rhine River into Germanic territory. He wanted to demonstrate Rome's power and deter future invasions. After a brief show of force, he returned to Gaul, having made a significant statement. That same year, Caesar also attempted an invasion of Britain. Although his initial landing was met with resistance and logistical challenges, he returned the following year with a larger force and established a foothold on the island. These expeditions showcased Caesar's ambition and strategic vision. One of the most notable aspects of Caesar's campaigns in Gaul was his use of innovative tactics and strategies. He often relied on speed and surprise to outmaneuver his enemies. Caesar's legions were highly disciplined and well-trained, allowing him to execute complex maneuvers effectively. He also made extensive use of engineering skills, building bridges, fortifications, and siege works to support his operations. Caesar's military genius was perhaps best displayed during the siege of Elysia in 52 BC. The Gallic leader, Vercingetorix, had united several tribes in a revolt against Roman rule. He took refuge in the fortified town of Elysia, believing it would be impenetrable. Caesar responded by surrounding the town with a double ring of fortifications. The inner ring prevented the defenders from escaping, while the outer ring protected against a Gallic relief force. Despite being outnumbered, Caesar's forces held their ground. After weeks of siege and several fierce battles, Vercingetorix surrendered. The fall of Elysia marked the end of major resistance in Gaul and cemented Caesar's reputation as a brilliant strategist. The impact of Caesar's conquest of Gaul on Rome was profound. The vast wealth he acquired through plunder and the sale of slaves boosted Rome's economy. The expansion of Roman territory into Gaul brought new resources and trading opportunities. Additionally, the conquest increased Rome's strategic depth, securing its borders against potential threats from the north. Caesar's successes in Gaul also had significant political ramifications. His military achievements and the loyalty of his legions made him immensely popular among the Roman people. However, this growing power and influence also alarmed many in the Senate. Some feared that Caesar's ambition would threaten the Republic's stability. Despite these concerns, Caesar's conquests earned him a triumph, a grand celebratory parade in Rome. He was hailed as a hero, 
and his military accomplishments were celebrated widely. His detailed accounts of the Gallic Wars, written in Commentari de Bello Gallico, further enhanced his reputation. These writings provided a first-hand look at his campaigns and showcased his skills as a writer and propagandist. The conquest of Gaul also transformed Caesar's political landscape. His newfound wealth allowed him to pay off his debts and finance his political activities. The loyalty of his soldiers gave him a powerful private army, which he could use to influence Roman politics. This shift in power dynamics set the stage for the conflicts that would eventually lead to the end of the Roman Republic. In summary, Caesar's conquest of Gaul was a pivotal chapter in his rise to power. His military campaigns demonstrated his tactical brilliance and ability to adapt to different challenges. The impact of these conquests on Rome was significant, boosting the economy, expanding territory, and altering the political landscape. Caesar's achievements in Gaul laid the groundwork for his future successes and cemented his legacy as one of history's greatest military leaders. As we continue to explore Caesar's life, we will see how the skills and experiences he gained during the Gallic Wars influenced his actions and decisions in the years to come. His journey from a military commander in Gaul to the ruler of Rome is a story of ambition, strategy and unparalleled achievements. Chapter 5 Crossing the Rubicon Julius Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon River was a pivotal moment in Roman history. It marked the beginning of a civil war that would ultimately lead to the end of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. This chapter explores the rising political tensions with the Senate, Caesar's decision to cross the Rubicon, and the initial stages of the civil war. By the end of his campaigns in Gaul, Caesar had become extremely powerful and popular. His military successes had brought him wealth and the unwavering loyalty of his soldiers. However, his growing power also made many in the Senate uneasy. They feared that Caesar's ambition threatened the traditional power structures of the Republic. At this time, the Senate was dominated by Caesar's political rival, Pompey the Great, and his allies. Pompey had once been Caesar's ally, but their relationship had soured over time. The Senate, influenced by Pompey, ordered Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome as a private citizen. They demanded this to prevent him from using his army to seize power. Caesar faced a difficult decision. If he obeyed the Senate's order, he risked losing his power and possibly facing prosecution for his actions during his consulship. On the other hand, defying the Senate would mean declaring war on Rome. Caesar weighed his options carefully, understanding the gravity of his choice. In early January 49 BC, Caesar made his decision. He addressed his soldiers, explaining the situation and asking for their support. His troops, fiercely loyal to their commander, stood by him. Caesar then led his army south toward the Rubicon River, the boundary between his province and Italy proper. As he approached the river, Caesar is said to have paused, aware of the monumental consequences of his actions. Crossing the Rubicon with his army was an act of rebellion against the Senate, a declaration of civil war. According to historical accounts, Caesar famously declared, Alea iacta est, meaning, the die is cast, as he led his troops across the river. The crossing of the Rubicon was a bold and irreversible step. News of Caesar's defiance spread quickly, causing panic in Rome. Many senators, including Pompey, fled the city, fearing for their safety. They retreated to the south, where they began to gather their forces to oppose Caesar. Caesar, demonstrating his characteristic decisiveness, moved swiftly. He marched his army towards Rome, encountering little resistance. 
His rapid advance surprised his opponents, who were still trying to organize their defenses. Within weeks, Caesar had taken control of Rome, solidifying his position as the most powerful man in the city. With Rome under his control, Caesar turned his attention to chasing down Pompey and the senatorial forces. Pompey had retreated to Brundisium, a port city in southern Italy, hoping to escape to Greece and rally more support. Caesar pursued him, but Pompey managed to flee across the Adriatic Sea with his forces. Undeterred, Caesar began consolidating his power in Italy. He secured the loyalty of key regions and ensured the stability of Rome. Meanwhile, he prepared his forces for a campaign in Greece to confront Pompey. Caesar's ability to move quickly and decisively was a key factor in his initial successes during the Civil War. In the spring of 48 BC, Caesar and his army crossed the Adriatic Sea, landing in Greece. There he faced a larger and better supplied army commanded by Pompey. The two forces engaged in a series of manoeuvres and skirmishes, each trying to gain the upper hand. The decisive battle came at Pharsalus in August 48 BC. Despite being outnumbered, Caesar's troops were highly experienced and well-disciplined. Caesar employed brilliant tactics, including a surprise cavalry attack that broke Pompey's lines. Pompey's army was routed and he fled the battlefield. Pompey escaped to Egypt, hoping to find refuge with the Ptolemaic rulers. However, upon his arrival, he was betrayed and assassinated. His death marked the end of significant organized resistance to Caesar in the eastern Mediterranean. With Pompey gone, Caesar turned his attention to securing his control over the rest of the Roman territories. He traveled to Egypt, where he became involved in the complex politics of the Ptolemaic dynasty. There, he formed a famous alliance with Cleopatra, further extending his influence. Caesar's civil war continued with campaigns in Asia Minor, North Africa and Spain, where he defeated the remaining senatorial forces. His military genius and the loyalty of his soldiers allowed him to overcome these challenges and emerge victorious. By 45 BC, Caesar had effectively won the civil war. He returned to Rome as the unrivaled leader of the Roman world. His victory marked the end of the Roman Republic as he was appointed dictator for life. Caesar implemented numerous reforms aimed at stabilizing and strengthening Rome. He reorganized the calendar, restructured the debt, and initiated various public works projects. Despite his successes, Caesar's concentration of power and disregard for traditional republican norms created unease among some senators. They feared that Caesar intended to establish a monarchy, which went against the very principles of the Republic. On the Ides of March, 44 BC, a group of senators conspired against Caesar. They assassinated him in the Senate chamber, believing they were saving the Republic. However, Caesar's death plunged Rome into further chaos and conflict, leading ultimately to the rise of the Roman Empire under his adopted heir, Octavian, later known as Augustus. Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon was a turning point in Roman history. It set in motion a series of events that ended the Republic and paved the way for the Roman Empire. His bold decision and the ensuing civil war showcased his strategic brilliance and unwavering ambition. Caesar's legacy as one of history's greatest leaders endures, and his actions continue to be studied and remembered for their profound impact on the world. Chapter 6 Civil War and Dictatorship The civil war that followed Julius Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon was marked by several key battles, each contributing to his eventual rise to power. Caesar's path to becoming dictator was paved with strategic victories and significant reforms that reshaped Rome. After Caesar crossed the Rubicon, 
The first major battle took place at Pharsalus in 48 BC. Caesar's forces, though outnumbered, faced Pompey's larger army. Using his strategic genius, Caesar devised a plan to counter Pompey's cavalry, which was his opponent's main strength. He placed his most experienced soldiers at the front, with orders to protect themselves with their shields and aim to disable the enemy horses. This tactic worked brilliantly. Pompey's cavalry was quickly neutralized, leading to a chaotic retreat. Caesar's troops then pressed the attack, breaking through Pompey's lines and forcing him to flee. This victory was a turning point, showing Caesar's superior command and securing his position as a formidable military leader. Pompey fled to Egypt, seeking refuge. However, upon his arrival, he was assassinated by orders of the Egyptian rulers, who hoped to gain favor with Caesar. When Caesar arrived in Egypt, he was presented with Pompey's severed head. Although he was relieved to see his rival gone, he was also saddened by Pompey's undignified end. Caesar then became embroiled in the local politics of Egypt, allying himself with Cleopatra. Their relationship was both personal and political, and Caesar helped Cleopatra secure her throne, strengthening Rome's ties with Egypt. Back in Rome, Caesar faced continued resistance from the senatorial forces. The next significant battle occurred in 47 BC at Zela in Asia Minor. Pharnaces II, the king of Pontus, had taken advantage of the Roman civil war to reclaim territories. Caesar moved quickly to confront him. The battle was short and decisive, ending in a swift Roman victory. Caesar famously described this battle with the phrase Veni, Vidi, Vici, meaning, I came, I saw, I conquered, emphasizing the speed and efficiency of his triumph. Caesar then turned his attention to North Africa, where the remnants of Pompey's supporters had regrouped. In 46 BC, he faced a combined force of Roman senators and African allies at the Battle of Thapsus. Once again, Caesar's military tactics led to a decisive victory. The defeat of these forces effectively ended organized resistance to his rule in the region. The final major conflict of the civil war took place in Spain at the Battle of Munda in 45 BC. Pompey's sons had raised a large army in a last-ditch effort to challenge Caesar. The battle was fiercely contested, with Caesar's forces struggling initially. However, his personal leadership on the battlefield and the discipline of his legions turned the tide. The victory at Munda marked the end of significant opposition to Caesar's dominance. With his enemies defeated, Caesar returned to Rome as the undisputed leader. Caesar's rise to dictatorship was swift and marked by both his military prowess and political acumen. Upon returning to Rome, he was appointed dictator for ten years. This position gave him unprecedented power, effectively placing him above the law. In 44 BC, he was named Dictator Perpetuo, or Dictator for Life. This move, however, alarmed many senators who feared Caesar intended to become a monarch, which went against the republican ideals Rome was founded on. As dictator, Caesar implemented numerous reforms that transformed Roman society and government. One of his first acts was to address the debt crisis. He enacted laws to limit the amount of debt repayment and reduce interest rates, easing the burden on many citizens. This move gained him considerable support among the lower classes. Caesar also reformed the Roman calendar. The old lunar calendar was inaccurate, leading to confusion and misalignment with the seasons. With the help of astronomers, Caesar introduced the Julian calendar, a solar-based system that more accurately reflected the year. This calendar, with slight modifications, is still in use today. To address the problems of corruption and inefficiency in government, Caesar expanded the Senate, 
increasing the number of senators to represent a broader segment of the population. He also introduced new laws to curb corruption and improve the administration of justice. Caesar's public works projects were another significant aspect of his rule. He initiated the construction of new buildings, temples and public spaces, transforming the city of Rome. These projects not only beautified the city, but also provided employment for many Romans, boosting the economy. Additionally, Caesar focused on expanding Roman citizenship. He granted citizenship to people in various provinces, integrating them more fully into the Roman state. This move helped to unify the diverse populations within the empire and ensure their loyalty to Rome. Caesar's reforms extended to the military as well. He increased the pay and benefits for soldiers, ensuring their loyalty and improving their morale. He also established colonies for veterans, giving them land and a place to settle after their service. These measures strengthened the army and secured the support of the military, a crucial aspect of his power. Despite his many reforms, Caesar's concentration of power and his disregard for republican traditions created significant opposition. Many senators viewed his dictatorship as a threat to the republic's ideals of shared governance and checks on power. This opposition culminated in a conspiracy led by Brutus, Cassius, and other senators who believed they were acting to save the Republic. On the Ides of March, 44 BC, Caesar was assassinated in the Senate chamber. He was stabbed multiple times by the conspirators, dying at the foot of a statue of Pompey. His death plunged Rome into further turmoil, leading to more civil wars and the eventual rise of his adopted heir, Octavian, who would become the first Roman emperor, Augustus. Caesar's civil war and dictatorship marked a critical transition in Roman history. His military victories and political reforms reshaped Rome, ending the Republic and paving the way for the Roman Empire. Caesar's legacy is one of extraordinary achievement and profound impact, his life and actions continuing to be studied and remembered for their historical significance. Chapter 7 Governance and Reforms Julius Caesar's time as dictator was marked by significant governance and reforms. His changes to the administration, social reforms, and economic policies reshaped Roman society and government. These reforms aimed to stabilize Rome, improve efficiency, and address various social and economic issues. One of Caesar's first administrative changes was expanding the Senate. Traditionally, the Senate was composed of about 600 members, mostly from noble families. Caesar increased this number to 900, allowing more people from different backgrounds to become senators. This move aimed to reduce the power of the old aristocracy and include more supporters of Caesar in the Senate. By doing this, he hoped to create a more balanced and representative governing body. Caesar also reorganized the local governments in Rome and the provinces. He appointed new officials to oversee various regions, ensuring that they were loyal to him and capable of managing their responsibilities. These new governors were often military commanders who had served with Caesar, ensuring their loyalty and competence. This reorganization improved the efficiency of local administrations and helped maintain stability throughout the empire. To further streamline the administration, Caesar reformed the calendar. The old Roman calendar was based on the lunar cycle and often became misaligned with the seasons. With the help of astronomers, Caesar introduced the Julian calendar, a solar-based system that more accurately reflected the year. This calendar had 365 days, with an extra day added every four years. The Julian calendar greatly improved timekeeping and is the basis for the calendar we use today. In addition to administrative changes, 
Caesar implemented numerous social reforms to improve the lives of ordinary Romans. One of his most significant social reforms was the redistribution of land. Many Romans, especially soldiers and the poor, struggled with landlessness. To address this issue, Caesar confiscated land from his political enemies and distributed it to his soldiers and the urban poor. This redistribution not only helped alleviate poverty, but also secured the loyalty of his troops and supporters. Caesar also focused on public works projects to provide employment and improve the infrastructure of Rome. He initiated the construction of new buildings, temples, and public spaces. These projects beautified the city and provided jobs for many Romans. Some of his notable projects included the construction of the Forum of Caesar, which housed a new temple dedicated to Venus Genetrix, and the rebuilding of the Basilica Julia, a large public building used for legal and other civic activities. To further address social issues, Caesar enacted laws to curb corruption and improve the administration of justice. He introduced stricter penalties for bribery and other forms of corruption, hoping to create a more honest and efficient government. Additionally, Caesar reformed the judicial system, making it more accessible and fair to ordinary citizens. These changes aimed to restore trust in the government and ensure that justice was served more equitably. Economic policies were another crucial aspect of Caesar's reforms. He recognized that Rome's economy needed stabilization and growth to support his other initiatives. One of his first economic reforms was to address the debt crisis. Many Romans were heavily in debt, leading to social unrest and economic instability. Caesar enacted laws that reduced the interest rates on debts and limited the amount of debt repayment, easing the burden on debtors. This move helped stabilize the economy and gained him considerable support from the lower classes. Caesar also reformed the tax system. He abolished the existing system of tax farming where private individuals collected taxes on behalf of the state, often leading to corruption and abuse. Instead, he implemented a more direct and regulated system of tax collection, ensuring that taxes were collected fairly and efficiently. This reform increased state revenue and reduced corruption, helping to fund Caesar's various projects and initiatives. Another significant economic policy was the expansion of Roman citizenship. Caesar granted citizenship to many people in the provinces, integrating them more fully into the Roman state. This move not only increased the tax base, but also helped unify the diverse populations within the empire. By extending the benefits of citizenship, Caesar fostered loyalty and a sense of belonging among the provincial populations. Caesar also focused on improving trade and commerce. He encouraged the construction of new roads and harbours, facilitating easier and more efficient movement of goods and people. These infrastructure improvements boosted trade within the empire and with foreign territories, contributing to economic growth. In addition to these reforms, Caesar introduced measures to support and reward his soldiers. He increased their pay and provided them with land upon retirement. This not only ensured the loyalty of his troops, but also helped integrate them into civilian life. By taking care of his soldiers, Caesar maintained a strong and loyal military, which was crucial for his continued power and the stability of Rome. Despite these significant reforms, not everyone supported Caesar's changes. Many senators and aristocrats saw his actions as a threat to their traditional power and influence. They feared that Caesar's concentration of power undermined the republican ideals of shared governance and checks on authority. This opposition eventually led to a conspiracy against him, culminating in his assassination on the Ides of March in 44 BC. Caesar's reforms had a lasting impact on Rome. 
His administrative changes improved the efficiency and stability of the government. His social reforms addressed critical issues of poverty, landlessness and corruption, improving the lives of many Romans. His economic policies stabilized the economy, increased state revenue and promoted growth. Despite his controversial methods and the opposition he faced, Caesar's governance and reforms left a profound legacy that shaped the future of Rome. After his death, Rome plunged into further turmoil, but the foundations Caesar laid through his reforms continued to influence the structure and governance of the Roman Empire. His ability to implement wide-ranging changes in such a short time demonstrated his vision and effectiveness as a leader. Caesar's legacy as a reformer and ruler remains a significant part of his enduring historical impact. Chapter 8 Personal Life and Relationships Julius Caesar's personal life and relationships were as dynamic and influential as his military and political career. His connections with family and friends, his marriages and romantic affairs, and his public perception all played significant roles in shaping his life and legacy. Caesar's family background was one of the key factors in his rise to power. Born into the patrician Gens Julia, he was connected to some of Rome's most prestigious families. His father, Gaius Julius Caesar, and his mother, Aurelia Cotta, came from noble families with strong political ties. Aurelia was known for her intelligence and strength of character, and she played a significant role in Caesar's upbringing, instilling in him the values of duty and ambition. Caesar was particularly close to his mother and often sought her advice. Aurelia's influence helped shape his early political career and provided him with a solid foundation of support. His father passed away when Caesar was just sixteen, leaving him the head of the family. This responsibility forced Caesar to mature quickly and develop the leadership skills that would later define his career. One of Caesar's most important relationships was with his uncle by marriage, Gaius Marius, a prominent general and statesman. Marius was married to Caesar's aunt Julia, and his political career and military achievements had a profound impact on young Caesar. Marius was a leader of the Populares, a political faction that sought to represent the interests of the common people against the aristocracy. His influence on Caesar was significant, guiding him towards a career that balanced military prowess with populist political strategies. Caesar's friendships were also crucial in his rise to power. He formed alliances with powerful figures such as Marcus Licinius Crassus, the wealthiest man in Rome, and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, known as Pompey the Great. These relationships were mutually beneficial, helping Caesar secure financial support and military backing. Crassus provided the financial resources Caesar needed to pursue his political ambitions, while Pompey's military reputation and influence helped Caesar gain the respect and support of the Roman legions. Marriage was another important aspect of Caesar's personal life. His first marriage was to Cornelia, the daughter of Lucius Cornelius Cinna, a powerful politician and ally of Marius. This marriage strengthened Caesar's ties to the populares. Cornelia and Caesar had one daughter, Julia, who would later play a significant role in his political alliances. Tragically, Cornelia died in 69 BC, leaving Caesar deeply affected by her loss. Caesar's second marriage was to Pompeia, the granddaughter of Sulla, Marius's rival. This marriage was politically motivated, aimed at bridging the divide between the populares and the optimates, the aristocratic faction. However, the marriage was not a happy one. Pompeia was involved in a scandal during the festival of Bonadea, which led to accusations of infidelity. Although there was no solid evidence against her, Caesar divorced Pompeia, famously stating that Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. Caesar's third and final marriage was to Calpurnia, the daughter of a prominent senator. 
This marriage was also politically advantageous, helping Caesar solidify his position within the Roman elite. Despite his political marriages, Caesar was known for his numerous romantic affairs. His most famous affair was with Cleopatra, the Queen of Egypt. Their relationship began when Caesar visited Egypt in pursuit of Pompey and quickly became both a romantic and political alliance. Cleopatra bore him a son, Ptolemy XIV, known as Caesarion. Their relationship strengthened Rome's ties with Egypt and enhanced Caesar's influence in the eastern Mediterranean. Caesar's romantic liaisons were well known and often discussed by the Roman public. Despite his many affairs, he was generally admired for his charisma and leadership. His ability to charm both men and women helped him build a network of loyal supporters and allies. However, his romantic entanglements also provided his political enemies with ammunition to criticize him. The public perception of Caesar was complex and multifaceted. To many, he was a hero and a champion of the people. His military successes and reforms endeared him to the common citizens, who saw him as a leader capable of bringing about positive change. Caesar's efforts to redistribute land, alleviate debt, and provide public entertainment through grand games and spectacles made him immensely popular among the lower classes. However, Caesar's accumulation of power and his disregard for republican traditions alarmed many in the Senate and the aristocracy. They viewed him as a threat to the Republic's ideals of shared governance and feared that he aimed to establish a monarchy. These fears culminated in his assassination by a group of senators who believed they were protecting the Republic from Caesar's perceived tyranny. Caesar's personal charisma and public persona played crucial roles in his rise to power. He was a master of public relations using his oratory skills and public appearances to win the support of the masses. His writings, particularly his commentaries on the Gallic Wars, portrayed him as a brilliant and heroic leader, further enhancing his reputation. Despite the controversies surrounding his personal life, Caesar's ability to connect with people on a personal level helped him maintain a broad base of support. His charm and eloquence made him a beloved figure among many Romans, even as he navigated the treacherous waters of Roman politics. Chapter 9. Conspiracies and Opposition Julius Caesar's rise to power was not without opposition. Throughout his career he faced numerous political enemies and conspiracies. This chapter explores the key figures who opposed Caesar the major conspiracies against him and the build-up to the assassination plot that ultimately ended his life. As Caesar's power grew, so did the number of his political enemies. Many senators and aristocrats viewed his actions with suspicion and fear. They were alarmed by his reforms, his accumulation of power and his disregard for republican traditions. Among his most prominent opponents, were Cato the Younger, Cicero, and Marcus Junius Brutus. Cato the Younger was a staunch defender of the Republic. Known for his integrity and unwavering commitment to Roman values, Cato opposed Caesar at every turn. He believed that Caesar's ambition threatened the Republic's survival. Cato's eloquence and moral authority made him a formidable adversary in the Senate. His speeches against Caesar were powerful and persuasive, rallying many senators to his cause. Cicero, another influential senator, was initially ambivalent about Caesar. A renowned orator and statesman, Cicero valued the Republic's traditions and feared that Caesar's actions would lead to tyranny. Though he admired some of Caesar's reforms, Cicero ultimately sided with the senatorial opposition, hoping to preserve the Republic's integrity. One of the most complex relationships in Caesar's life was with Marcus Junius Brutus. Brutus was the son of Caesar's mistress, Servilia, and had a close, almost paternal relationship with Caesar. Despite their bond, Brutus was deeply committed to the Republic. 
He was torn between his loyalty to Caesar and his belief in republican principles. This internal conflict would play a significant role in the events leading up to Caesar's assassination. As Caesar's power consolidated, conspiracies against him began to form. One of the earliest plots emerged during his campaign in Spain. A group of disgruntled senators, fearing Caesar's growing influence, planned to assassinate him upon his return to Rome. The plot was discovered and foiled, but it highlighted the increasing danger Caesar faced from within the Senate. Another significant conspiracy occurred in 63 BC, known as the Catiline Conspiracy. Although this plot primarily targeted the consulship of Cicero, it underscored the turbulent political climate of the time. The conspiracy involved a group of senators led by Lucius Sergius Catilina, who planned to overthrow the government and seize power. While Caesar was not directly involved, the atmosphere of suspicion and betrayal affected all political leaders, including him. The final and most famous conspiracy against Caesar culminated in his assassination. By 44 BC, Caesar had been appointed dictator for life, a position that many senators viewed as a direct threat to the Republic. They feared that Caesar intended to become a king, a concept anathema to Roman ideals. The tipping point came when Caesar accepted several honours and symbols of power traditionally associated with monarchy, such as the laurel wreath and the title of Imperator. The senator's fears were further fueled by rumours that Caesar planned to move the capital from Rome to Alexandria or another city in the east. These rumours, whether true or not, intensified the sense of urgency among his opponents. They believed that drastic action was necessary to save the Republic. The conspiracy to assassinate Caesar was led by Gaius Cassius Longinus and Marcus Junius Brutus. Cassius, a former supporter of Pompey, was deeply resentful of Caesar's power. He convinced Brutus to join the plot by appealing to his sense of duty to the Republic. Brutus, despite his personal affection for Caesar, was persuaded that Caesar's death was necessary to restore the Republic's principles. The conspirators, numbering around 60 senators, meticulously planned the assassination. They chose the Ides of March, March 15, 44 BC, as the date for their action. The Senate was scheduled to meet on that day, providing the perfect opportunity to strike. The plan was to attack Caesar in the Senate chamber, where weapons were not allowed, and Caesar would be vulnerable. On the morning of the Ides of March, Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, begged him not to go to the Senate. She had been troubled by ominous dreams and premonitions of his death. Despite her pleas and the warnings from others, Caesar decided to attend the Senate meeting, dismissing the fears as superstition. As Caesar entered the Senate chamber, he was surrounded by the conspirators. They pretended to petition him on various matters, drawing him into the centre of the room. Suddenly, one of the conspirators, Tilius Simba, grabbed Caesar's toga, signalling the start of the attack. The senators drew their hidden daggers and began to stab Caesar. Caesar fought back initially, but he was quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of attackers. According to historical accounts, he was stabbed twenty-three times. In his final moments, he is said to have recognised Brutus among the attackers and uttered the famous words, Et tu, Brute, meaning, and you, Brutus. This phrase has since become synonymous with betrayal. Caesar's assassination was brutal and swift. He fell at the base of Pompey's statue, a poignant and ironic end for a man who had once been his greatest rival. The conspirators believed they had saved the Republic, but they had underestimated Caesar's influence and the loyalty he commanded among the Roman people. The aftermath of Caesar's assassination was immediate and chaotic. 
Rome was plunged into a power struggle as Caesar's supporters sought to avenge his death. Mark Antony, Caesar's loyal lieutenant, delivered a stirring funeral oration that turned public opinion against the conspirators. The people of Rome, who had benefited from Caesar's reforms, were outraged by his murder. The conspirators, hoping to restore the Republic, found themselves vilified and isolated. The power vacuum left by Caesar's death led to further conflict and civil war. Caesar's adopted heir, Octavian, later known as Augustus, joined forces with Antony to defeat the conspirators and their allies. This alliance eventually led to the establishment of the Roman Empire, with Octavian as its first emperor. Chapter 10 The Ides of March Julius Caesar's assassination on the Ides of March, 44 BC, was a pivotal moment in Roman history. The details of his murder, the immediate aftermath, and the impact on Rome politically and socially reveal the significance of this event. On the morning of March 15th, Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, was filled with dread. She had been troubled by nightmares and ominous dreams, sensing something terrible was about to happen. She pleaded with Caesar to stay home and avoid the Senate meeting. Her concern was shared by some of Caesar's friends, who had also heard rumors of a possible plot. Despite these warnings, Caesar decided to go. He dismissed the fears as mere superstition, confident in his power and authority. As Caesar made his way to the Senate, he was met by several conspirators who had planned to kill him. These men, including Gaius Cassius Longinus, Marcus Junius Brutus and others, had prepared carefully for this moment. They believed that assassinating Caesar was the only way to save the Republic from what they saw as his tyrannical rule. The Senate meeting was held at the Theatre of Pompeii, a temporary location while the usual Senate house was being renovated. As Caesar entered the chamber, he was surrounded by senators, some of whom were part of the conspiracy. They approached him with petitions, distracting him and positioning themselves close to strike. Suddenly, one of the conspirators, Tilius Simba, grabbed Caesar's toga, pulling it down from his shoulders. This was the signal to attack. The first blow came from Casca, who struck Caesar in the neck. Startled, Caesar turned and tried to fend off the attack. He saw the daggers of his friends and colleagues flashing in the air. He fought back briefly, but was overwhelmed by the sheer number of attackers. Each conspirator stabbed him in turn, delivering a total of twenty-three wounds. As he realized the extent of the betrayal, Caesar's resistance waned. According to legend, he saw Brutus, whom he regarded almost like a son, among the attackers, and uttered the famous words, Et tu, Brut, meaning, and you, Brutus. This phrase has become synonymous with ultimate betrayal. Caesar fell at the base of Pompey's statue, covered in blood, his life ending in a pool of irony and tragedy. The immediate aftermath of Caesar's assassination was chaotic. The conspirators, believing they had saved the Republic, tried to calm the Senate. However, panic and confusion spread rapidly. Many senators fled the chamber, fearing for their own lives. The news of Caesar's death quickly reached the public, causing shock and outrage. Mark Antony, Caesar's loyal friend and lieutenant, managed to escape the Senate and went into hiding, fearing that he might be the next target. He quickly realized the need to seize control of the situation to prevent further violence and chaos. Antony's primary concern was to ensure that Caesar received a proper funeral, which he believed would help maintain public order and honor his fallen leader. Three days after the assassination, Caesar's will was read to the people of Rome. In it, he named his grandnephew Gaius Octavius, later known as Octavian, as his primary heir. He also left a substantial amount of money to the citizens of Rome and arranged for his gardens to be turned into public parks. These generous provisions further endeared him to the public, 
and intensified their sense of loss and betrayal. The funeral of Julius Caesar was a turning point. Mark Antony delivered a powerful and emotional eulogy that stirred the hearts of the Roman people. He held up Caesar's bloodied toga and pointed to the wounds, describing the treachery of the conspirators. Antony's speech inflamed the crowd, leading to riots and attacks on the homes of the conspirators. The people of Rome were outraged by the murder of a man they saw as a hero and benefactor. The assassination of Julius Caesar had profound political and social consequences for Rome. Politically, it created a power vacuum and plunged the Republic into a series of civil wars. The conspirators, who hoped to restore the Republic, underestimated the loyalty and support Caesar had among the people and the army. Instead of stabilizing Rome, his death destabilized it further. Mark Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus formed the Second Triumvirate, a powerful alliance that sought to avenge Caesar's death and defeat the conspirators. They launched a campaign against Brutus, Cassius, and their supporters, leading to the decisive battles of Philippi in 42 BC. The Triumvirate's victory marked the end of the conspirators and the final collapse of the republican ideals they sought to protect. Socially, Caesar's death marked the end of the old republican order. His assassination highlighted the deep divisions and power struggles within the Roman elite. The Republic, with its system of checks and balances and shared governance, was no longer viable. The people, weary of constant power struggles and civil wars, were increasingly willing to accept a single ruler who could provide stability and peace. Octavian, who emerged as the victor in the power struggles that followed Caesar's death, became the first Roman emperor, taking the name Augustus. He carefully crafted his image as the restorer of peace and stability, building on the legacy of Caesar. The Roman Empire, with its centralized power and imperial structure, replaced the fractured republic. Caesar's assassination also had a lasting cultural impact. His life and death became the subject of countless works of art, literature and drama. William Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar immortalized the events of the Ides of March, capturing the tension, betrayal and tragedy of the assassination. The phrase, et tu, brute, became a symbol of ultimate betrayal and the complex dynamics of political power. Chapter 11. Legacy and Influence Julius Caesar's legacy is vast and complex, touching on the immediate aftermath of his death, his long-term influence on Rome and the world, and the diverse historical perspectives on his life and rule. The immediate legacy of Julius Caesar was chaos and upheaval. His assassination on the Ides of March, 44 BC, created a power vacuum in Rome. The conspirators, led by Brutus and Cassius, believed they had saved the Republic, but they misjudged the loyalty and affection Caesar commanded among the people and the army. Instead of restoring the Republic, his death plunged Rome into further turmoil. Following Caesar's assassination, Mark Antony seized the opportunity to rally the public against the conspirators. His stirring funeral oration turned the Roman populace against Brutus, Cassius, and their allies. Riots broke out, and the homes of the conspirators were attacked. The conspirators were forced to flee Rome, setting the stage for a new round of civil wars. The power struggle that ensued saw the formation of the Second Triumvirate, composed of Mark Antony, Octavian, Caesar's grand-nephew and heir, and Lepidus. This alliance sought to avenge Caesar's death and defeat the conspirators. The Triumvirate's forces met Brutus and Cassius in the decisive battles of Philippi in 42 BC. The defeat and subsequent suicides of Brutus and Cassius marked the end of the senatorial opposition. In the short term, Caesar's death led to the collapse of the Roman Republic. 
The old system of shared governance and checks on power could not withstand the ambitions and conflicts of Rome's leading figures. The Republic, with its deep-seated political divisions and recurring civil wars, was no longer viable. In the long term, Caesar's legacy was the transformation of Rome from a republic to an empire. Octavian, who emerged as the dominant leader after the civil wars, took the name Augustus and became the first Roman emperor. He presented himself as the restorer of peace and stability, building on Caesar's legacy. Augustus's reign marked the beginning of the Roman Empire, which would endure for centuries. Caesar's influence extended beyond political transformations. His reforms had lasting impacts on Roman society and governance. The Julian calendar, introduced by Caesar, was a significant improvement over the old lunar calendar and is the basis for the modern calendar used today. His reorganization of the Senate and the extension of Roman citizenship helped integrate the diverse populations of the empire, fostering a sense of unity and shared identity. Caesar's military campaigns and writings also left a profound legacy. His commentaries on the Gallic Wars, written in a clear and direct style, became classic texts of military strategy and Latin literature. They provided insights into his military tactics and leadership, influencing both contemporaries and future generations. Caesar's long-term legacy also includes his role as a symbol of power and ambition. Throughout history, many leaders have looked to Caesar as a model of effective leadership and strategic genius. His life story, marked by ambition, bravery, and dramatic reversals of fortune, continues to captivate and inspire. Historical perspectives on Julius Caesar are diverse and often contradictory. Ancient sources, such as the writings of Suetonius and Plutarch, provide detailed accounts of his life highlighting both his achievements and his flaws. Suetonius in The Twelve Caesars portrays Caesar as a brilliant and ambitious leader whose rise to power was marked by both noble deeds and ruthless actions. Plutarch, in his Parallel Lives, offers a more balanced view, emphasizing Caesar's intelligence and charisma, while also noting his ambition and the controversies surrounding his rule. Later, Historians have continued to debate Caesar's legacy. Some view him as a visionary leader who laid the foundations for the Roman Empire and brought stability and reform to Rome. Others see him as a tyrant whose actions led to the downfall of the Republic and the loss of Roman democratic traditions. In modern times, Caesar's life and legacy have been the subject of countless books, plays and films. William Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar is one of the most famous depictions, capturing the drama and intrigue of his assassination and the moral complexities of his character. The play's exploration of themes such as power, betrayal and ambition resonates with audiences across the ages. Caesar's name itself has become synonymous with leadership and authority. The title Caesar was adopted by Roman emperors and later influenced the titles of other rulers, such as the Russian Tsar and the German Kaiser. This linguistic legacy underscores Caesar's enduring influence on world history. In conclusion, Julius Caesar's legacy is multifaceted and enduring. The immediate aftermath of his death led to further civil wars and the eventual rise of the Roman Empire. His reforms and military achievements had lasting impacts on Rome and the wider world. Historical perspectives on Caesar vary, reflecting his complex character and the dramatic events of his life. Whether viewed as a hero, a tyrant, or a tragic figure, Caesar's life and legacy continue to captivate and influence generations. Chapter 12 Caesar as a Writer Julius Caesar was not only a military and political leader, but also a gifted writer. His writings and speeches have had a lasting impact on literature and education. 
This chapter explores his literary contributions, their influence on Roman and world literature, and how his works are used in education. Caesar's most famous literary works are his commentaries on his military campaigns, the Commentarii de Bello Gallico, commentaries on the Gallic War, and Commentarii de Bello Civili, commentaries on the Civil War, are his major surviving works. Written in clear, straightforward Latin, these commentaries provide detailed accounts of his campaigns and insights into his strategies and leadership. The Commentarii de Bello Gallico consists of eight books, each detailing a year of Caesar's campaigns in Gaul. These commentaries describe the battles, tactics and diplomacy involved in subduing the Gallic tribes. Caesar's writing style is concise and direct, making complex military manoeuvres and political situations easy to understand. His ability to convey information clearly and vividly has made these works enduring classics of military literature. The Commentari de Bello Civili covers the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. This work is shorter than his Gallic commentaries, but equally significant. It offers a detailed narrative of the events leading up to and during the war, providing Caesar's perspective on the conflict. Through his writing, Caesar justifies his actions and presents his side of the story, aiming to win public and political support. In addition to his commentaries, Caesar was known for his speeches. As a skilled orator, he delivered many speeches in the Senate and to his troops. While most of his speeches have not survived, historical accounts suggest they were powerful and persuasive. His ability to speak effectively was a crucial tool in his rise to power, helping him gain the support of both the Senate and the Roman people. Caesar's literary style influenced Roman and world literature significantly. His commentaries set a standard for military and political writing, blending factual reporting with engaging narrative. Later historians and writers, such as Suetonius, Plutarch and Tacitus, were influenced by Caesar's clear and direct style. They adopted his approach of combining historical detail with storytelling, making their own works more accessible and engaging. Caesar's writings also influenced the development of Latin prose. His use of straightforward language and simple sentence structures made his works a model for clarity and precision. This influence extended beyond Roman literature to the broader Western literary tradition. Renaissance writers and scholars who admired classical texts were inspired by Caesar's works. His commentaries were studied and imitated, contributing to the revival of classical learning and the development of modern historiography. The educational influence of Caesar's works is profound. For centuries, his commentaries have been used as educational texts in the study of Latin. Their clear language and engaging content make them ideal for teaching Latin grammar and vocabulary. Students learn not only the language, but also Roman history and military strategy through these texts. Caesar's commentaries are often included in Latin curricula in schools and universities. They provide a window into Roman culture, politics and military practices, offering students a comprehensive understanding of the ancient world. The texts are also used to teach rhetorical skills, as students analyse Caesar's techniques for persuasion and narrative. In addition to Latin studies, Caesar's works are valuable resources in history and political science education. They offer first-hand accounts of significant historical events, providing primary source material for studying the late Roman Republic. Students and scholars use these texts to gain insights into Caesar's strategies motivations, and the broader political context of his time. Caesar's commentaries also serve as case studies in leadership and military strategy. His detailed descriptions of battles and campaigns are studied in military academies and leadership courses. 
They illustrate the importance of clear communication, strategic planning, and adaptability in achieving success. Caesar's ability to inspire and lead his troops, as evident in his writings, continues to be a source of inspiration and learning for military leaders and strategists. The lasting impact of Caesar's literary contributions is a testament to his skill as a writer and communicator. His works have transcended their original purpose of documenting military campaigns, becoming enduring classics of literature and education. They offer valuable lessons in language, history, and leadership, continuing to influence readers and students around the world. In conclusion, Julius Caesar's legacy as a writer is as significant as his achievements as a military and political leader. His commentaries and speeches provide clear, engaging accounts of his campaigns, influencing Roman and world literature. They set a standard for historical and military writing, blending factual reporting with narrative skill. In education, Caesar's works are invaluable resources for studying Latin, history, and leadership. His ability to communicate complex ideas clearly and effectively ensures that his writings remain relevant and influential to this day. Chapter 13 Cultural Depictions Julius Caesar has been a prominent figure in culture and art for centuries. From ancient Roman times to modern movies and books, he has been depicted in various ways, reflecting different aspects of his personality and achievements. In ancient Roman culture, Caesar was viewed with a mix of admiration and controversy. After his assassination, he was deified by the Roman Senate. This act reflected the immense impact he had on Roman society. Temples were built in his honor, and his image appeared on coins and statues. These depictions emphasized his status as a powerful leader and divine figure. The Roman people, especially those who benefited from his reforms, saw him as a hero who brought stability and prosperity to Rome. Ancient writers and historians like Suetonius, Plutarch, and Cicero also provided detailed accounts of Caesar's life. Suetonius, in The Twelve Caesars, highlighted both his accomplishments and personal flaws. Plutarch's Parallel Lives compared Caesar to other great figures of history, emphasizing his leadership qualities and ambition. Cicero, although critical of Caesar's rise to power, acknowledged his remarkable abilities. These works contributed to the complex and multifaceted image of Caesar in ancient times. Throughout the ages, Caesar's life and legacy have inspired countless works of art and literature. During the Renaissance, interest in classical antiquity led to a renewed focus on Caesar. Artists and writers were fascinated by his story, which embodied themes of power, ambition, and betrayal. In literature, one of the most famous depictions of Caesar is William Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. Written in 1599, the play explores the political intrigue and moral dilemmas surrounding his assassination. Shakespeare's portrayal of Caesar is nuanced, showing him as both a powerful leader and a man vulnerable to ambition and manipulation. The play's famous lines such as, Et tu, Brute, have become iconic, encapsulating the themes of loyalty and betrayal. Artists have also been drawn to Caesar's dramatic life. Renaissance painters like Titian and Rubens created powerful depictions of key moments, such as his assassination and triumphs. These works often emphasized the dramatic and emotional aspects of his story, capturing the tension and intensity of his life. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the neoclassical movement brought another wave of interest in Caesar. Sculptors and painters like Antonio Canova and Jean-Léon Jérôme created works that celebrated his military prowess and leadership. These depictions often idealized Caesar, portraying him as a symbol of strength and heroism. Modern interpretations of Caesar have continued to evolve, reflecting contemporary values and interests. 
In movies and television, Caesar has been portrayed by numerous actors, each bringing their own interpretation to the role. One of the most notable portrayals is by Marlon Brando in the 1953 film adaptation of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Brando's performance as Mark Antony delivering the famous funeral oration is still celebrated for its intensity and emotion. Another significant film is the 1970 movie Julius Caesar, starring Charlton Heston as Mark Antony. This adaptation brought a new visual and dramatic interpretation to the story, highlighting the political intrigue and personal conflicts that defined Caesar's life. In addition to film, Caesar has been depicted in television series such as HBO's Rome. This series provides a detailed and historically rich portrayal of Caesar's rise to power and his complex relationships with other key figures of the time. The show's depiction of Caesar, played by Kieran Hines, presents him as a shrewd and ambitious leader, navigating the treacherous political landscape of Rome. Books have also explored Caesar's life from various angles. Historical novels like Colleen McAuliffe's Masters of Rome series delve into the intricacies of his career and the broader context of Roman politics. These novels offer a detailed and immersive look at Caesar's world, combining historical accuracy with compelling storytelling. Non-fiction works, such as Adrian Goldsworthy's Caesar Life of a Colossus, provide a comprehensive and scholarly analysis of his life and legacy. These books examine not only his military and political achievements, but also his personal life, and the cultural impact of his rule. Caesar's influence extends beyond traditional media into popular culture. He has appeared in comic books, video games, and even cartoons, reflecting his enduring appeal. For example, the Asterix series, a popular French comic, features Julius Caesar as a recurring character. These comics, while humorous and fictional, introduce younger audiences to his historical figure and his significance. In video games, Caesar often appears as a character in strategy games like Civilization and Total War. These games allow players to engage with his historical context, making decisions and strategies that reflect his leadership style. Overall, Julius Caesar's cultural depictions are as diverse as they are numerous. From ancient statues and coins to modern movies and video games, he remains a figure of fascination and intrigue. His life story, marked by ambition, power and dramatic events, continues to captivate audiences around the world. These various depictions highlight different aspects of Caesar's personality and achievements, contributing to a rich and multifaceted legacy. Whether seen as a hero, a tyrant, or a tragic figure, Julius Caesar's impact on culture and art is undeniable. His story continues to be told and retold, each generation finding new meanings and lessons in his extraordinary life. Chapter 14. Caesar's Military Genius Julius Caesar's military genius is legendary. His strategies and tactics were innovative, and his leadership on the battlefield was unmatched. This chapter explores his military strategies, describes his most famous battles, and highlights the reforms he made to the Roman military system. Caesar's military strategies were characterized by speed, surprise, and flexibility. He believed in moving quickly and decisively to catch his enemies off guard. This approach often gave him a significant advantage in battle. Caesar was also a master of logistics, ensuring that his armies were well supplied and could move rapidly across vast distances. One of Caesar's key strategies was his use of engineering and fortifications. He frequently built fortifications to protect his troops and control the battlefield. For example, during the siege of Elysia, he constructed a double line of fortifications around the city to keep the defenders in and prevent reinforcements from breaking through. This tactic trapped the enemy and led to a decisive victory. 
Another important tactic was Caesar's use of cavalry. He understood the mobility and speed of cavalry units and used them effectively for reconnaissance, flanking maneuvers and quick attacks. His ability to integrate cavalry with infantry and artillery made his forces more versatile and adaptable to different combat situations. Caesar's most famous battles showcase his military genius. The Battle of Alesia in 52 BC is one of his greatest achievements. Facing the united Gallic tribes led by Vercingetorix, Caesar used a combination of engineering and tactical brilliance. By building fortifications around the city and a second set of defences facing outward, he created a trap that defeated the Gallic forces inside and repelled their reinforcements. This victory secured Roman control over Gaul and demonstrated Caesar's strategic mastery. Another significant battle was the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC during the civil war against Pompey. Outnumbered and facing a formidable opponent, Caesar used clever tactics to win. He positioned his troops to counter Pompey's cavalry, which was his main strength. By placing his experienced veterans at key points and using a reserve force to attack Pompey's cavalry, Caesar turned the tide of the battle. His victory at Pharsalus was a turning point in the civil war, solidifying his control over Rome. The Battle of Zela in 47 BC is remembered for Caesar's swift and decisive victory over Pharnaces II of Pontus. Caesar's famous remark, Veni, Vidi, Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered, reflects the speed and efficiency with which he defeated his enemy. This battle showcased his ability to quickly assess the situation and execute a plan with precision. In addition to his battlefield successes, Caesar implemented several military reforms that strengthened the Roman army. One of his key reforms was the reorganization of the legions. He standardized the structure of the legions, making them more uniform and efficient. Each legion consisted of roughly 5,000 soldiers, divided into cohorts and centuries. This organization improved command and control, allowing for more coordinated and effective operations. Caesar also focused on improving the training and discipline of his troops. He believed that a well-trained and disciplined army could outperform larger, less organized forces. His soldiers underwent rigorous training and were held to high standards of discipline. This emphasis on training ensured that his troops were prepared for the challenges of battle and could execute complex maneuvers with precision. Another significant reform was Caesar's treatment of his soldiers. He ensured that they were well paid and rewarded for their service. This approach fostered loyalty and morale among his troops. Caesar's practice of granting land to veterans upon their retirement helped integrate them into Roman society and ensured their continued support. This policy not only benefited the soldiers, but also helped to stabilize and expand Roman territories. Caesar's reforms extended to the use of auxiliary troops. He recognized the value of incorporating non-Roman soldiers into his armies. These auxiliaries provided additional manpower and specialized skills, such as archery and cavalry. By integrating auxiliaries into his forces, Caesar increased the diversity and capabilities of the Roman military. One of Caesar's lasting contributions to the Roman military was his emphasis on flexibility and adaptability. He encouraged his commanders to be innovative and responsive to changing battlefield conditions. This approach allowed the Roman army to remain effective against a wide range of enemies and in various types of terrain. Caesar's ability to adapt his strategies and tactics to different situations was a key factor in his military success. In summary, Julius Caesar's military genius was evident in his strategies, tactics and reforms. His ability to move quickly, use engineering and fortifications, 
and integrate different types of troops set him apart as a commander. His famous battles, such as Alesia, Pharsalus, and Zella, showcased his strategic brilliance and tactical innovation. The reforms he implemented strengthened the Roman military and ensured its effectiveness for generations to come. Caesar's legacy as a military leader continues to be studied and admired, highlighting the enduring impact of his genius on the art of warfare. Chapter 15. The Roman Republic Before Caesar Before Julius Caesar rose to power, the Roman Republic had a long and complex history. Understanding the Roman Republic's historical background, political structure and key figures helps to set the stage for Caesar's dramatic impact on Rome. The Roman Republic was established in 509 BC after the overthrow of the Roman Kingdom. The Republic was designed to prevent any one person from gaining too much power, a reaction to the tyranny of the last king, Tarquin the Proud. The new system of government was based on checks and balances, with power shared among different branches and officials. The Roman Republic's political structure was intricate and carefully balanced. At the top were the consuls, two elected officials who served as the highest authority in the Republic. They commanded the army and presided over the Senate and the assemblies. Consuls were elected for one-year terms, and their power was limited by their colleagues' equal authority and the principle that they could only serve once every ten years. The Senate was another crucial institution in the Republic. Composed of Rome's elite, the Senate was responsible for foreign policy, financial matters, and advising the consuls. Senators were usually former magistrates, and their lifetime appointments gave them significant influence. Although the Senate could not pass laws, its decrees, Senatus Consulta, were highly respected and often followed. The Roman Republic also had several popular assemblies, such as the Centuriate Assembly and the Tribal Assembly. These assemblies allowed citizens to vote on laws and elect magistrates. The Centuriate Assembly was organized by wealth and military class, giving more power to the wealthy. The Tribal Assembly was more democratic, with each tribe, based on geographical divisions, having one vote. Various magistrates, including praetors, aediles and quaestors, played essential roles in the Republic. Praetors were responsible for administering justice, aediles oversaw public works and games, and questors managed financial affairs. The cursus honorum, or course of honours, was the traditional career path for Roman politicians, starting with lower offices like quester and advancing to higher positions like consul. One unique feature of the Roman Republic was the office of the dictator. In times of crisis, a dictator could be appointed with near absolute power for a limited term of six months. This provision allowed for decisive action during emergencies, but was meant to prevent long-term tyranny. Before Caesar's time, several key figures shaped the Roman Republic. One of the most influential was Gaius Marius, a general and statesman who reformed the Roman army. Born into a plebeian family, Marius rose to prominence through his military successes. He was elected consul an unprecedented seven times, and implemented significant military reforms, such as recruiting landless citizens and reorganizing the legions. These changes made the army more professional and loyal to their generals, rather than the state, which had long-lasting implications for Roman politics. Lucius Cornelius Sulla was another crucial figure in the late Republic. Arrival of Marius, Sulla was a patrician, and a general who became dictator after a brutal civil war. Sulla's dictatorship was marked by prescriptions, a series of political purges that eliminated his enemies. He also enacted reforms to strengthen the Senate's power and limit the influence of popular assemblies and tribunes. Although Sulla retired voluntarily, 
His actions set a precedent for using military force to achieve political power. The conflict between Marius and Sulla highlighted the growing tensions within the Republic. These tensions were rooted in the struggle between the Optimates, who supported the traditional power of the Senate and the aristocracy, and the Populares, who sought to champion the cause of the common people through the assemblies. This division would continue to play a significant role in the Republic's political landscape. Another key figure was Pompey the Great, a military and political leader who rose to prominence in the same era as Caesar. Pompey achieved great military successes in the East, expanding Roman territories and securing vast wealth. He was celebrated with multiple triumphs in Rome and formed the first triumvirate with Caesar and Crassus. Pompey's alliance with Caesar was initially strong, but their relationship deteriorated, leading to the civil war that ultimately ended the Republic. Marcus Licinius Crassus, the third member of the first triumvirate, was known for his immense wealth and political influence. Crassus made his fortune through real estate and various business ventures. He played a key role in suppressing the slave revolt led by Spartacus and used his wealth to support political allies, including Caesar. Crassus's death in 53 BC during a failed military campaign against the Parthians weakened the triumvirate and contributed to the subsequent conflict between Caesar and Pompey. Cicero a renowned orator, lawyer, and statesman, was another important figure. He was a staunch defender of the Republic and its traditional values. Cicero's speeches and writings provide valuable insights into the political climate of the time. Although he opposed Caesar's rise to power, Cicero's commitment to the Republic and his eloquence made him one of the most respected figures in Roman history. The Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, were earlier figures who attempted significant social and political reforms. They sought to address economic inequality by redistributing land to the poor and limiting the power of the Senate. Both brothers faced fierce opposition from the Senate and were ultimately killed for their efforts. Their deaths underscored the deep divisions within Roman society and the resistance to reform among the elite. These key figures, along with the complex political structure of the Roman Republic, set the stage for Julius Caesar's rise. The Republic's system of checks and balances was designed to prevent any one person from gaining too much power, but the ambitions and conflicts of its leaders gradually undermined this balance. The growing power of military commanders, the struggle between the Optimates and Populares and the persistent social and economic issues all contributed to the Republic's instability. As Caesar entered this turbulent political landscape, he leveraged his military successes, strategic alliances and popular support to navigate the intricate power dynamics of the Republic. His rise to power was a culmination of the trends and conflicts that had been building for decades. By understanding the historical background, political structure, and key figures of the Roman Republic before Caesar, we can better appreciate the profound impact he had on the course of Roman history. As Caesar entered this turbulent political landscape, he leveraged his military successes, strategic alliances, and popular support to navigate the intricate power dynamics of the Republic. His rise to power was a culmination of the trends and conflicts that had been building for decades. By understanding the historical background, political structure, and key figures of the Roman Republic before Caesar, we can better appreciate the profound impact he had on the course of Roman history. Chapter 16 The End of the Republic Chapter 16 The End of the Republic Julius Caesar played a crucial role in the end of the Roman Republic. His actions, both as a military leader and a political figure, set in motion events that ultimately led to the Republic's collapse 
and the emergence of the Roman Empire. Caesar's rise to power began with his military conquests. His victories in Gaul brought him immense wealth and the loyalty of his soldiers. These achievements gave him significant influence in Roman politics. However, his growing power made many senators uneasy. They feared that Caesar's ambition threatened the republic's system of shared power. In 49 BC, the Senate, led by Caesar's rival Pompey, ordered Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome as a private citizen. Caesar faced a choice, obey the Senate and risk losing his power, or defy them and start a civil war. He chose the latter, famously crossing the Rubicon River with his army and declaring, The die is cast. This act of defiance marked the beginning of a civil war between Caesar and Pompey. Caesar's swift and decisive actions during the civil war showcased his military genius. He quickly gained control of Italy and pursued Pompey to Greece. The decisive battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC saw Caesar's smaller but more experienced army defeat Pompey's larger forces. Pompey fled to Egypt, where he was assassinated. With Pompey gone, Caesar was left as the uncontested ruler of Rome. As dictator, Caesar implemented numerous reforms. He centralized the government, reducing the power of the Senate and increasing his own. He reformed the calendar, introduced new laws to alleviate debt, and redistributed land to veterans and the poor. While these reforms were popular with the people, they further alienated the Senate and the aristocracy. Caesar's accumulation of power and his disregard for republican traditions alarmed many senators. In 44 BC, a group of senators, including his close friend Brutus, conspired to assassinate him. They believed that by killing Caesar, they could restore the Republic. On the Ides of March, they executed their plan, stabbing Caesar to death in the Senate chamber. Caesar's assassination plunged Rome into chaos. The conspirators had hoped to restore the Republic, but they underestimated Caesar's influence and the loyalty he commanded. The immediate aftermath of his death was marked by uncertainty and conflict. Mark Antony, Caesar's loyal ally, seized the opportunity to consolidate power. In a powerful speech at Caesar's funeral, Antony turned public opinion against the conspirators. The Roman people, who had benefited from Caesar's reforms, were outraged by his murder. Riots erupted in the city, and the conspirators were forced to flee. In the power vacuum left by Caesar's death, Antony formed an alliance with Octavian, Caesar's adopted heir, and Lepidus, a prominent general. This alliance, known as the Second Triumvirate, sought to avenge Caesar's death and defeat the conspirators. The Triumvirate launched a campaign against Brutus and Cassius, leading to the decisive battles of Philippi in 42 BC. The defeat and subsequent suicides of Brutus and Cassius marked the end of the senatorial opposition. The political landscape of Rome changed dramatically after Caesar's death. The Second Triumvirate divided the Roman territories among themselves, with Antony taking the East, Octavian the West, and Lepidus Africa. However, the alliance was unstable, and tensions soon arose between Antony and Octavian. Antony's relationship with Cleopatra, the Queen of Egypt, further complicated matters. His involvement with Cleopatra and his perceived neglect of Roman interests alienated many Romans. Octavian skillfully used this situation to turn public opinion against Antony, portraying him as a traitor who had been seduced by a foreign queen. The conflict between Antony and Octavian culminated in the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Octavian's forces decisively defeated Antony and Cleopatra's fleet. The couple fled to Egypt, where they both committed suicide. With Antony's defeat, Octavian became the sole ruler of Rome. In 27 BC, 
Octavian took the title Augustus, marking the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. Augustus carefully maintained the appearance of republican institutions, but in reality he held absolute power. He reformed the government, creating